This is week number four in the series, Developing Fervency in Prayer. So we want to just go into some things. Philippians chapter four, we went over this uh, in the past. This is a foundation, one of the foundational scriptures of this uh, series. It says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. That word careful means don't have an anxious thought, which is worry. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Right? Always with thanksgiving. And then what happens? The peace of God, which is not of this world, it, it, it's way beyond anything in this world, comes directly out of your spirit, right from the Holy Spirit himself, and it just mounts guard over your heart and over your mind. It keeps you at peace. We're going to see in having an effective prayer life, you can't be stressed and pray out of your spirit. Right? You'll, you'll, start, you'll start going a wrong direction because you'll stop, you'll stop flowing with the Holy Spirit. You'll get into fear and your prayers will be fear-based and that'll never be scriptural. Before you know it, you'll start begging God all these things that are not scriptural. And God wants you to pray effectively with Him. What we're talking about, this series, I get a sense that we're going to lay a very, very strong foundation so that you can take what you're learning here, and not only apply it to your life and learn how to communicate, how to fellowship with your Heavenly Father, that you can learn how to walk with Him intimately and know Him, but that you'll be able to teach others this too. Because everything with God is simple. The cookies are on the bottom shelf, so to speak. Amen? Amen. I love that. So we said this about prayer, just to get back up to speed. Prayer always brings God's peace into our lives. We learn that right from this scripture. Prayer always releases God's power into our lives, which will always bring about his miracles in our lives. Always. Prayer will always change the way that you think about yourself, about others, and about your circumstances. It'll give you a God perspective, not a natural perspective. Prayer, what is it? We're inviting heaven to intervene with the affairs of earth, right? We're inviting God to come into your situation. Whatever you're facing right now, God wants to invade it with his will and his presence. He wants you to walk out everything that he's already given you in Christ. So very, very important. Prayer, in other words, always gets God involved in our circumstances. So, we said that. Now, let's look at, real quick, let's look at Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians is a book of incredible doctrine. But in Ephesians chapter 6, it's real interesting that at the end of this book, in the last chapter, first five chapters, Paul said a lot of stuff, a lot of big time stuff. And now in chapter 6, in verse 10, he's going to say, finally, my brethren, this in the Greek, it literally means now to the most important thing I'm going to say to you. Basically, in the Greek, it's so strong that he's be saying, he, it would be like him standing here going, listen, if you don't get anything else that I've said, you have to get this. What did he say? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And right there is a must for an effective prayer life. As we're going to see by the time we get to verse 18, that the whole thing that he's going to say for all these verses is to prepare you for a life of prayer. All of it is. So look at this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You're never to be strong in yourself. In the literal Greek, it would read like this. Finally, my brethren, be continually strengthened inwardly in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay? Why do we need to do that? So that we can do this. 
put on the whole armor of God. Literally, this word put on is the Greek word enduo. Remember Jesus said, listen guys, after he was risen, he told his disciples, don't go out and do anything. You go to Jerusalem until you be enduoed with power from on high. So this armor that we're talking about, it's not something, this word put on, it's not like you're dressing yourself. Okay? It, it's, you don't ever want to take the helmet of salvation off, do you? Right? No. No. So this armor, if you do a study on it, it is revelation knowledge of God's word. That's what the armor is. And how that applies to your prayer life is all of your prayer life, all of it. Our whole lives as children of God, the word of God has to be the foundation. So it literally means be endued with the whole armor of God. Well, how do you do that? By being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay? Because what is working on the inside of us? The word of God is the power of God, right? So let's keep going with this. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That you may be able to stand. Notice the, the way this blanket statement is, is all of us are going to have to deal with the wiles of the devil. Now we know, the, and you've heard me teach on this, the word wiles, that sounds really crazy. Right, oh God, or Satan is so spooky. No, no. It literally, it's the Greek word methodius. It means to travel down one road one way. The wiles of the devil. Satan comes against every one of us the same way. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about how to have an effective prayer life. Because you are a child of God. You know how to communicate with your heavenly Father. On a spirit-to-spirit -spirit level, you know how to flow with him. Now, you might be sitting here going, no, no I, I, I don't. No, you do. You do. You have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You're, the only thing that masks it is we think naturally. And we think fleshly. And we buy the lies of the enemy that we can't understand the things of God and it's hard and it's spooky and all this stuff. No, 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 no. As we're going to see, the foundation of your prayer life is really finding out who you really are. Not who you seem to be. Because tonight you might have come and you feel pretty beat up. You feel like, man, I'm a failure, like all this stuff is a mess. Right? Now, I don't know who that is, but I know at least two people are definitely feeling that way. Now, don't raise your hands, because this is between you and God, but it's all a lie. You're more than a conqueror. That's what the Word of God says. So let's keep going with this thought. Just hang on to it right now. You guys are all kind of looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against. This word against, it literally means stand face to face with the wiles of the devil. He's traveling down one road one way, and the word devil exposes exactly how he comes. The word devil is the word diabolos. Dia. Dia means to penetrate through to the other side of something. How does he penetrate through? By abolos, by throwing something blow after blow after blow after blow. Well, you know if you do a study, it's real clear in the New Testament, Satan throws thought after thought after thought after thought to try to penetrate your mind so that he can, it's the Greek word noemata, so that he can do mind games and scramble your thinking. This is what messes people up in prayer so many times. So the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Allow the whole armor of God to manifest upon you in the literal Greek while you continually draw from his power so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, so are, we, are you tracking with me? So let's keep going. Because remember, this is talking about, this is all talking about preparing you to pray. 
So it says here, we got to understand this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So people are never your enemy. Right? I, I, so so when, I, when, I, when I pray for my governmental leaders, it doesn't matter if maybe I'm praying for one that, you know, the Holy Spirit's stirring me. I mean, he stirs me to pray for some that I literally, I've, I've literally looked and tried to find something that I would like about what they do. And I can't many times, but I can still love them with all my heart. Why? Because they're not the enemy. I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The enemy is never going to be able to mess me up in my prayer life by getting me to pray naturally. No, my prayers are going to be stirred by the Spirit. They're going to go right to the core of it because I know I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness, it, it says in heavenly places, but really in the King James it gets it right, it's high places. Many translations will say heavenly. High places, that literally means the air below the mountains. If you're a charismatic Christian in the 80s, I remember, you know, we would go up on, people would invite me to go up on Saddleback Mountain. They would go to army surplus stores and, and get army gear, and we're going to go pull down principalities and powers. They'd have meetings where they'd go up in airplanes to, to get up there to pull. That's a bunch of nonsense, right? Where's Satan at? He's walking to and fro on the earth. We give him way too much credit. But we wrestle against this satanic hierarchy, right? That's why I bridle my tongue in the presence of my enemies. Because I understand, man, there's demon powers. There's all this hierarchy of his that know every button. They've seen my life. They know my relatives' lives. They know all this stuff. They, they try to push my buttons. They'll create circumstances, situations. They'll use people. But guess what? I have knowledge from God's word that I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Does that make sense? That'll simplify your prayer life a lot. It'll make it very simple. But who, but what do I wrestle against? What do I wrestle against? If I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood, I'm wrestling against principalities and powers, well, how do they come? The wiles of the devil. They throw thoughts after thought, after thought, circumstance, thoughts. You're nothing. This will never work out. You'll never be healed. You'll never prosper. You'll never amount to anything. Your marriage is over. Your relationship's over. All of this constant. But if I don't try to be strong in myself, but I realize that I'm going to be continually strengthened inwardly in the Lord, then this is when I realize the walk of faith, it's a rest. My prayer life is a rest. Satan can't stop my communication with my Heavenly Father. And I know if he hears me when I pray according to his will, I already know I have what I've asked him for. I don't have to see it. Do, do you see how good that is? This is all about it. Now remember, this is getting us ready to pray. So it says here, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, what is the evil day? Well, today it's the 20th of November. Guess what? Uh, let me prophesy. Tomorrow it'll be the 21st. Okay? That's all right. We've already won. That you may be able to stand it withstand in the evil day. And then it says this, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Most people are unable to stand because they don't prepare to stand. So this will all fit together, and this is why we've been talking about fervency in prayer is all about cutting away the flesh, getting over yourself, presenting your body a living, holy sacrifice so that you're prepared to stand. Because if you're messing around with a bunch of thoughts and a bunch of stuff that God, God's not in, you'll try to stand in your own strength and you'll never be able to stand. Having done all to stand, 
is get over yourself, give it to the Lord, and stand, resting in the fact that he loves you, that he's already got it all under control, he's already got it fixed, he's already went before you and won the battle. He doesn't have to give you anything. He's already given you all things to pertain to life and godliness. Isn't that good news? Could it be that simple? Absolutely. And when this dawns on our spirit, wow, are things going to change in the earth and in the church. You're going to see the greatest miracles in the history of humanity. It's going to be this, it's going to be the easiest thing in the world. It's amazing. Why? Because we've made it all about us. If I pray more, if I know more, if I do more, when in reality, never forget this, it's all about him. It's all about him. And he loves you. Got to know that. So it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. And then it goes on, talking about the armor. Right? And then at the end of verse 17, now it's going to get into verse 18. What, when now I take unto myself, I allow the armor of God, which through meditating in the word day and night, putting the word first place, giving it my undivided attention, keeping it ever before my eyes, never letting it depart out of my mouth, always keeping it in the midst of my heart. Now what's happening is the armor's manifesting upon me. Do you see this? So now I'm ready. And now verse 18. Praying how often? Always. Philippians says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Praying what? Always. With all prayer. The Amplified Version says this, with all manner of prayer. They bring out the Greek very well. All manner of prayer. We'll get into that because there's different types of prayer. There's nine different types of prayer. And we, and we want to pray effectively, right? With all manner of prayer, and look at this as we keep going, in the Spirit. I love Weymouth's translation. It's a New Testament translation. Weymouth brings out the Greek. It doesn't say in the Spirit. It says stirred by the Spirit, your whole prayer life is to be orchestrated and stirred by the Holy Spirit. You don't see. He orchestrates it. Your whole prayer life, in order to be effective, is he's got to stir you to pray. Have you ever tried to pray for something and there was no stirring there? That's no fun. The more sensitive you get, the more you realize there's no stirring. When you're learning some of these things, you'll just try to push it through, right? I've been the master at that. I remember when the Lord told me one time, he said, Tony, ministry is very hard when you're working and I'm not working. Now, because he's so uplifting, you're just like, yeah, I know. You know, and I saw myself just beating my head against the wall, always wondering why it wasn't working out. So good. Praying always with all manner of prayer, stirred by the Spirit, orchestrated by the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance. This means with all persistency and supplication for all saints. So we're to pray always for all saints. Well, how can you pray for all saints? I mean, I don't know what's going on with every believer everywhere. So that tells me I need to be helped by the Holy Spirit. I need his help. In other words, this whole teaching on how to have a, the foundation of an effective prayer life, give it up, we need his help. So this is why, as you give yourself to this, as you simply go to him and go, I want to really learn how to walk with you and commune with you and and have this prayer life where you can use me to cause heaven to intervene in the affairs of earth. I mean, it's just a wonderful thing. You realize it's all him. Very important that we realize that. Can't, 
can't stress that enough. Been walking with the Lord for a long time. The more I see, the more I realize I just got to give it up because it's just all Him. Surrendering to the Holy Spirit's leading enables you to develop an effective prayer life. This is everything. You learn how to surrender to the Holy Spirit's leading. See, this is what happens in our lives if we're not careful because we have this sin nature still in our flesh. And if we don't govern our thought life and we start looking at wrong things, we start, we'll start seeing things wrong and it will get in pride in areas and it'll develop what we call blind spots. I'm always asking the Lord, show me what I'm not seeing. Show me what I'm seeing wrong. Do you know the number one thing that he shows me many times that I'm seeing wrong is my perception of what's going on in my own life. I mean, even though he delivered me from this worthlessness years and years ago, every once in a while I'll sit there and go, wait a minute, I just kind of, I'm buying into this. What, what is that? I'm so thankful he shows you that stuff. Because you are a world overcomer. Why? Because you've been born of God. You are God's child. You are made to dominate this world system. If you'll get quiet, this is why so, much, so many Christians are so frustrated because they're being dominated by the world when they're supposed to be dominated. Most, they're supposed to be dominating the world system. They're supposed to be the head and not the tail. It doesn't work for us to not be above only. Does that make sense? And this is not, see, this is not the world's positive thinking. You know, this is a different, this is, this is impossible thinking. This is where all things now are possible to me because I believe him. I, I Forget positive thinking. We got to go way beyond that. Positive thinking is if the boat's going down, and I just be positive. So, well, the boat's still going to go down. But what God is talking about is where you can speak and see God come and keep the boat from going down. That's what we're talking about here. That's what the world needs to see. Praying effectively is praying according to the word of God, stirred or directed by the Holy Spirit. That is a big part of our prayer life. And oh, will he teach you how to flow with him. He'll teach you how to flow with him. Prayer, in other words, is joining forces with your heavenly father. Not where he lines up with you. It's where you line up with him. And walk in the Zoe life of God that he's provided for you. So we have to develop fervency in our prayer life. We talked about that a little bit. I want to go a little further in that tonight. As the Holy Spirit, remember we said this last time, as the Holy Spirit stirs you to pray, what happens now is fervency increases. Fervency is zeal. It means things get big on the inside of you. Have you ever been fervent about something? Right? I remember August 20th of 1989, I got real fervent about a young lady that I saw a few rolls in front of me in church. I saw the back of her head, and I, 30 years later, I'm still very fervent, <laughs> right? There's a lot of zeal. I could tell you, whatever God has called you to do, there's, there's a fire there for you. It'll fuel you to serve him. It'll fuel you to get over yourself and get a global mentality, to, 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 to be compassionate to the uncompassionate. It'll just fuel everything. So, and as, as that happens, see, see, as this fervency increases, what happens is you get increasingly sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But in order to do that, as we said, you have to cut away the things of the flesh. What's, what's going on in the church in many areas today is we're trying to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And you just can't do it. You, you can't, you're either being 
conform to the world, the things, the outside pressures are pressing you into the mold of the world, or you're being transformed on the inside by the Spirit of God. So what does that look like in your life? Nobody, no other Christian, no pastor can tell you what that looks like. You have to find out what that looks like. How? By letting the Holy Spirit leading you and always saying yes to him. For somebody, they might be able to do this thing over here and it's fine, but for another person, no. Right? Whatever that is. There are times when football is a great thing in my life. There are other times when football would be disobedience. How do I find... There, here's a big one. So, as a pastor, I never really know what I'm going to study. So I'm doing this series on prayer, but what if the Lord wants to talk to me about something else? Guess what? It'd be disobedient for me to study the word on prayer if he wants to talk to me about the grace of God. Right? What are we talking about? We have to work out what he's working in. And there's freedom in that. See, you might think you know how to fix things in your life, but the Holy Spirit knows exactly how to fix them. You might think you need to go this way, but the Holy Spirit's going, nope, you come this way, right? I, I mean, we just don't know. So this is why we can't work out anybody else's salvation. We have to just work out our own with a reverence and an honor and a respect for the Lord, working out what he's working in. Why? Because I got to cut away these things in my flesh. Well, what do I cut away? Whatever he puts his finger on. It's just, yes, sir, here it is. Your flesh hates it. Your spirit loves it. Your spirit will love it. Because your spirit just wants to know him. Your spirit knows it's all okay. Your spirit man's at peace, knows the word's true. The problem is the mind is the control center. So if we don't, if we don't watch and renew our mind, we're going to think naturally and miss it. So fervency, it's what will give us, it will compel us to go to prayer. See, a lot of things with God are timing. You could, you could be in the middle of something, and if he pulls you away to prayer, don't ever think you don't have time. Now, you will think that almost every time in the natural. But if you'll pull yourself away to prayer, by the end of the day, you'll realize, man, I got more done than I would have ever got done had I not taken that three minutes to pray. Because he knows. So now jump over to another scripture talking about this fervency. Go to James chapter 5 in verse 16. You guys doing okay? This is kind of like prayer school. You're all kind of sitting there looking at me. You look so serious. I know you guys are hungry for the things of God. It's awesome. James chapter 5, verse 16. It says here, confess your faults one to another. So as you break this down in the Greek, this word faults, you could, you could, um, you could translate it faults or it could be translated sin. And it says one to another. Basically, what it's saying is confess your faults that you have between each other. So, so, let's, say, so let's say Jeanette and I, we, we've done some things, or I've done, I've done something where I have not respected or honored her. This is saying that I need to come to her and just confess that before her. Hey, sweetheart, I'm sorry I said this to you. I did this. I apologize. I should not have done that. That's what it's talking about. That's not just coming into church and go, okay, we're going to have a confession meeting. Okay, everybody, come on. We're just going to all confess all of our sins. No, no. That's if you have something in between each other. Why? Because I'm telling you, and, and I know Brother Hagen said this years ago, but if you're ever going to miss it, it'll probably always go back to the love walk somewhere. Always. So this is keeping your love walk right. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it says this, the effectual, 
fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual, that word effectual literally means well grounded on evidence. Fervent prayer. This word fervent literally means heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man avails much. I love the amplified version of the last statement of that verse. It literally says the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. What that is called in the amplified version, it has what's called parenthetical definitions. That is a parenthetical definition that brings out the Greek meaning of that verse. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its workings. See, many times our prayers lack the depth that heaven requires. Why? Because they're coming out of our mind and they're not coming out of our heart. And that's what we're talking about tonight. As you cut away the things of the flesh, you'll learn how to pray out of your spirit. Because many times our prayers are so shallow, there's no faith. By shallow, I mean there's no faith in them. And it's because it's coming out of our mind. It's coming out of this mental ascent. It's not coming. It's coming out of a sin consciousness, not a righteousness consciousness. This is so important. See, when our prayers come out of our mind, we'll pray incorrectly. We'll pray out of line with what the Word of God says. And we don't want to do that. See, when we do this, when we pray this way, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. When we pray this way, what that does is it brings this incredible, overwhelming awareness of God's presence in my life. That I know when I'm speaking to him, he's hearing me, which automatically means I have what I've asked him for. And nobody can ever talk me out of it because I know him. I know he's not a man that he would lie. He's not the son of man that he would change or repent. If he says it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. So this is a huge principle. As you pray out of your spirit, it brings an incredible awareness of God's presence in your life. God wants us to live under the influence of his divine nature. The Christian who grows in this, you're not stressed anymore. You're not, trying to, you're not trying to be successful. You already know because you're born of him, you're a world overcomer, and in him you already are successful. So, so circumstances and situations in my life, I laugh at you because you're all going to change and come in line with the word of God. I'm not trying to get healed because I am the healed. And now all sickness and disease, you've got to bow to who he is as my healer. Poverty and lack, I'm not trying to be prosperous. I am prosperous as a child of God. So now all poverty, all lack, you have to bow to who I am in him now. See, I have this incredible awareness of who I am. In other words, I'm a John 15, 7 believer. I'm abiding in him, and his words are abiding in me. So now I'll ask whatever I will, because my will is lined up with his will, and he'll, he'll do it. My, my heavenly Father, my Lord Jesus, they're watching over to their word to perform it. I love that. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of me. He's here to reveal truth to me, to bring revelation knowledge of who God is in my life. Because as I see who he is, I get to know who I am in him. And now, I'll never buy the wiles of the devil again. Do you see that? This is a beautiful thing. I love prayer because it's all about knowing him. It's so hard to teach on prayer. 
Because I just, I could sit up here and just cry. Because I mean, who am I? I'm just Tony who was lost and dead in my trespasses and sins. And the God of heaven came looking for me, made me brand new on the inside, put his spirit in me. Everything he's done in my life is so that I can know him. So now far be it for me to shoot any lower in this life. I'm not going to take any less than what he's given me. Why? Because this, I'm, all, I'm already okay. I'm set for eternity. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm set so now I'm free to live to show the world who he is. And boy, I'll tell you, as you get really into praying for the needs of others and stirred by the Holy Spirit to pray for others' needs, knowing all the time that while you're in this inner court just talking to him about how, he, how to help other people, he's in the outer court in your life working it all out for you. Right? It's the way it works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We must ask God to bring revelation to our hearts. How does revelation come? It comes only by the Holy Spirit. We must ask the Lord to bring revelation to our hearts of what? The principles and the mechanics and the spirit of prayer. We, need to, we, we can't just understand this with our mind. We have to comprehend these things with our spirit. We need revelation on the principles, the mechanics, and the spirit of prayer. Okay, this, just I would write that down, and, and as you grow in this, that will mean more to you. So we said this, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, if you'll notice, I'm kind of doing a review, then some new stuff, and then more of a review and some new stuff. So we're kind of, I'm kind of it's like a crossover dribble kind of like sermon tonight, right? Whatever that means. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us how to develop fervency in our prayer life. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We said this when we mentioned this verse, you yield your body as a living sacrifice. To do that, you have to know who you are in Christ. And then you have to reckon yourself dead to sin, which is your reasonable service. Reckon. That word means you have to count it to be done what is already a finished and established fact in your life. As you sit here tonight, you, as a child of God, if you're born again, you are dead to sin. Your spirit man couldn't sin. It can't sin. Now you might be sitting here going, are you kidding me? I just, on the way here, I sinned. Guy cut me off and I said this agit. No, no, no. No, your spirit didn't do that. No, you're, you basically, because of a lack of allowing your mind to be transformed by the renewing of, from the, with the word of God, sided with the sin nature in your flesh, and you acted out of your flesh. You did a sinful or unrighteous behavior, but not nature. You don't have a sin nature. Boy, the Judaizers would follow Paul and say, listen, don't listen to this guy. He's given everybody a license to sin. But the reality of it is, nobody needs a license to sin. Right? Now, does that mean a Christian can do anything they want? Well, if that's where you're living at, you're shooting way short. Because see, holiness, which is your lifestyle and your behavior, it flows out of righteousness, which is who you are. So if you live out of your spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if that excites you that now, man, I could go home and flesh out, Pastor Tony told me, it just means you're living out of your flesh. 
We need to get over this stuff. See, Paul taught this. This was a huge thing. I mean, people are still getting all upset about this hyper-grace message. Right? Like we really understand all that there is to know about grace. Oh, brothers and sisters, wow. The grace of God is so far beyond what we could even think. But I'm telling you that reckoning yourself dead to sin, knowing who you are in Christ, is the road for you to walk holy before him. If you don't know that you're dead to sin, if you still think that sin is dominating you, guess what you will do? Sin. And it'll bring death in your life, and it'll, it'll mess your thinking up, and it'll just it'll keep you from fulfilling God's plan. Do you ever notice when you turn away from sin how instantly there's forgiveness for you? You know why? Because all of your sins are paid for. See, we're talking about the difference between positional truth and temporal truth, something that's never taught, but if you don't understand it, you'll never understand most of what Paul wrote. Positionally, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. Temporally, I'm standing at Faith Family Church teaching you. Positionally, I'm seated with him. Positionally, I was crucified with him. I was buried with him in baptism. I was literally raised to newness of life. Positionally. Temporally, so if I sin, what am I really doing? It's sinful behavior, but it doesn't change my nature. It doesn't change anything about my relationship with God. And when I understand that, I'll be able to walk free from sin. It's even hard to preach. I mean, as I'm saying that right now, oh my goodness, I'll probably get some wonderful emails. That's all right. Bring scripture, right? You yield your body by knowing who you are in Christ, and then you reckon yourself dead to sin, which is your reasonable service. This is how I present my body a living sacrifice. This is how I live a sanctified life. A life that's set apart for the master's use. A Christian should look nothing like the world. I mean, think about it. I don't love conditionally. I love unconditionally. I'm not dominated by sin. I dominate circumstances. I, I, I'm able to literally walk and move and live in him. I operate in the faith of God where all things are possible. There's nothing like my life that looks like the world. So when I realize that's who I am, my lifestyle will look nothing like the world. Go to a restaurant and sit and listen to people sometimes. Every one of them are talking about somebody else. Judging, <laughs> gossiping. But they won't come to church because of all the hypocrites that judge and gossip and talk about, right? Right? But in reality, a Christian should never judge, should never gossip, or, or a, a Christian, man, I look at an alcoholic and I under, man, brother, I could tell you, I, I never drank one drop of alcohol and I know exactly how an alcoholic becomes an alcoholic when an alcoholic might not know that, right? I don't have a sexual addiction, but I understand exactly how it happens. A thought is thrown, and then I give that thought place, and then pretty soon I start speaking that thought and thinking about it, and then all these little principalities and powers, they get a vain imagination going in my mind, and then all of a sudden, I'll start walking it out, and my behavior comes. See, I understand all this stuff as a Christian, but I'm nothing like the world because I'm a child of God, and I'm here for this short time to bring heaven to this earth, to leave a fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere that I go. And that knowledge of God is that, not that God's going to get you, that God loves you, that God's not moved by your sin, that God already dealt with your sin, and right now is not even, not even holding it against you. I remember decades ago in a Mexican prison, 75 guys in a cage that were the most violent people in this state prison in Tijuana. 
And I was telling them about literally how that Jesus is not holding any of their sins against them. I mean, I didn't even understand really the depth of what I was saying. It was coming right out of my spirit. And you could see hope. But doesn't it say that? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins against them? Didn't it say that Jesus on the cross literally died for the sins of the whole world? I don't know why I'm getting off into all that, but it'll help you in your prayer life because you'll see who you are. See, Satan tries to ignite your flesh for the purpose of you not being a living sacrifice. But you can't stop with Romans 12.1. You got to know how to present your body a living holy sacrifice. That is told by us in Romans 12.2. Don't be conformed and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, reading God's word, we said this a little bit, but reading God's word is not enough. You must renew your mind to God's word. That means you got to have revelation knowledge in your heart, which is communicated to your mind so that the word of God can now renew your mind, rip out all that old thinking stuff and replace it with what the way God thinks. This is so important. you got to get God's word down on the inside of you so that you can reckon yourself to be who he says you are instead of of what the world is trying to tell you you are. The world will tell you you're weak, you're broke, you're sick. God will tell you you're whole, you're free. That's why people, the word of God says, let the weak say they're strong. Let the poor say they're rich. Why? Because this is a truth. Jesus was made poor that I, through his poverty, might be made rich. Does that make sense? So we think in line. This is so important. Paul is talking about, in this scripture, as we said last time, he's talking about a progression of walking out the will of God for your life as you renew your mind to his word. So important. So it's the difference. Are you letting the outside press you into the mold of the world, or are you letting the inside from the Holy Spirit, transform you. That's the difference. This is a foundational piece to an effective prayer life. You have to, you have to, not being pressed into the mold of the world, because if you're pressed into the mold of the world, this is what will happen every time. You'll lay hold of something, and then a little time will go by, circumstances get a little worse, and you'll let it go because I don't deserve it, it doesn't work, I just let it go. Versus the other person who's going, no, I know, let every man be a liar, but let God be true, right? His word is true, and I'm not letting the outside dictate my life, God's word dictates my life. So I'm not moved by what I see, I'm not moved by what I feel, I'm moved only by what he says. So now I can pray impossible situations look possible to me. I could come into a person's life who's broken and hurting and who the enemy has beat up and I could fill that person's life with joy coming out of me because I could say, listen, all things are possible to him who believes. There is a future for you. And that, my friend, is how you pray effectively for people Starting with yourself, for situations, for circumstances, you got to get this one right. I said this Sunday, but the renewed mind, I'll say this again, the renewed mind, the Romans 12 2 mind, it's not a mind that knows everything about the Word. To be honest with you, the more I learn about the Word of God, <laughs> the more I don't know. I mean, the more you realize, I mean, the more you learn, the bigger he gets. And the happier you get, because you're like, wow. 
you know, when we talk a million years from now, we're just going to be sitting here going, my father, right? He's so awesome. But the renewed mind does this. The renewed mind always goes to the word for everything first. The, the renewed mind, you'll know if your mind's renewed if you're running to the word first. If you're not running to the word first, you're letting the outside change you. Very important when it comes to prayer. Hallelujah. You guys doing okay? Hallelujah. So we went through this progression in Romans. I want to read it again. We're not going to have the time to go through that. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 8, it gives us six declarations that we must know to walk free from sin, to reckon ourselves dead from sin. In other words, to cut away this part of the flesh so that we can literally be in a position to hear from God. Romans 6, 3, verse 3, it talks about how that we were baptized or we were immersed, or you can say it this way, I was identified with his death. Number two happens in verse four, we were buried with him. The third one happens in verse four, we've been raised to newness of life. You have a new life. Man, I, I'd get real excited about that. Because anything in your life right now that does not look like what his word says has no legal right in your life. And it's not your job to get it out. It's your job to believe it and renew your mind to it and let him get it out of your life. And how do you do that? By praying effectively. By inviting heaven into your situation. It's everything. Hallelujah. In verse 5, it gives us number 4 that we were united together with him, it says it again, in the likeness of his death and his resurrection. Number five happens in verse six. The old man is crucified with him. And the last one, number six, is found in verse seven, that we've been freed from sin. Do you believe that tonight? Yeah. You're free. Never to be bound. He didn't set you free. We sing a lot of songs that set you free. No, no, he made you free. Never to be bound again. In other words, we were immersed. We were crucified. We were buried. We were united with him in death. United with him in the resurrection. Raised to newness of life. Freed from sin. And now we live with him and live in him. And he lives in us. Wow, we got to know this to walk in our freedom. Hallelujah. See, Satan will mess with you trying to tell you that your behavior is who you are. Salvation's not, not about behavior, it's about nature. People don't go to hell because they sin, they go to hell because they're spiritually dead. That's why they sin. Let's get that right. People go to heaven, why? Because of their nature. You, do you understand that, right? We're a new species. In other words, yours and my right to everything that Jesus gave us literally is all him. It's not your behavior. It's not what you do, it's what he did. When you realize that, it'll cause you to fall in love with him in ways that you never dreamed possible, and things will fly off of you, and you'll start to see who you really are. Adam's sin governed his family. Adam's sin caused sin and spiritual death to, to reign over the old man because we were Adam's seed. Jesus' sacrifice, though, received by faith, causes righteousness to reign over our new man because now we are Jesus' seed. Does that make sense? Jesus' sacrifice governs his family. So now, when the enemy comes to you and says, you don't have what you need, 
You don't have what you need to be healed, to prosper, all this stuff, to walk free, to walk in victory. What do we do? We point to Jesus because it's all in him. See, all of this, there's so much prayer that's begging God, that's not scriptural. And why is that? I mean, you know, I'm going to start bringing out some books that are great books on prayer. But never let them replace the word. Because you can understand every principle of prayer that there is. Every little wonderful catchphrase that there is. But not know who you are and not have an effective prayer life. Because you got to know who you are in him. Not who you are in yourself. Because in ourself, whatever, nothing's happening. But in him, all the promises of God are in Christ, yes. And in Christ, so be it unto me. Jesus' sacrifice governs his family. Look at what Romans 5.17 says. I'll kind of close with a couple scriptures here. For if by the trespass, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the amplified version of Romans 5, 17. For if by the trespass of one, Adam, death reigned through the one, Adam, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in eternal life through the one, Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. In other words, that because Jesus died for you, death is done in your life forever. Death has been defeated once and for all. Spiritual death, you'll never taste it. When you identify yourself with Jesus' death, then you are no longer subject to spiritual death, which means you're no longer subject to sickness, poverty, lack, all this stuff. Depression, anxiety, fear. You're not subject to that when you realize who you are in Christ. And you won't allow it in your life. Remember, God is sovereign. And here's rule number one of sovereignty on this earth. God has to allow what you allow. So don't allow it. That's what the Spirit of God's going to say to you. Right? Right? Boy, that, that, that'll get some religious people upset. But that's all right. Just come with Scripture, right? These things no longer have dominion over you. So Matthew 5, 6 says this. It's really cool. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, or for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Our lives as Christians should be marked by this growing hunger for God. As we see this, this fervency, it, you, should be, you should just have this continual growing in your hunger for God. Because you'll, you'll become more aware of how much he loves you, how free you are, all that he's provided. And it just makes you be passionate about him. Psalm 63.8 says this, My soul follows hard after thee. My, or, my soul follows hard after thee and your right hand upholds me. That's good news. When you get hungry, you will grow spiritually, which will cause you to walk in victory because you'll have an effective prayer life. This is so important. And you'll always got to know this about hunger. You always hunger for what you feed on. This is very, very important. See, when you stop feeding your natural body, your natural body will start getting very hungry and starts talking to you. Your spirit's not like that. When you stop feeding your spirit spiritual food, your spirit gets quiet because now your flesh is screaming. So how you get hungry when you have no what you think. See, people say, well, I have no desire for God. No, that's not true if you're born again. You have a desire for God, you just don't have any feelings that tell you you're having a desire for God. Well, how do I get there? All you got to do is make a decision and start feeding on the Word. Start getting up in the morning, spending time with Him. Your flesh will scream at you. You don't understand what you're reading. You're not getting anything out of this. You need to stop this. Then you do it at noon. 
Then at night, day one, day two, it's brutal. Day four, you're starting to, all of a sudden, you, you feel like a little hunger pain for God. Day eight, wow, you get up kind of hungry now. Day 30, you're hungry all the time. Day 60, you're a wild man like me. You, you, start, you start looking at your life. You're like an addict. I'm like a word addict. How can I spend more time with him? How can I get all this other stuff out of my way so I could just turn everything off and just be with him? Why? Because you feed on it. See, what's the difference? I'm going to leave you with this one. What is the difference between a person that prays and a person that doesn't? Is it their love for God? Nope. They're thinking that their feelings are their desires, but that's not true. Your desires come from God. The word desire means of the Father. But you're just letting the feelings of your flesh, because of what you've been feeding on, make you feel like you don't want to pray. Oh, you could talk about God for hours, but talking to God after 30 seconds, you're like, this is boring. Right? Or you think you're a deep and intercessory prayer and you look at your clock and you've been praying for two and a half minutes. <laughs> but here's the difference. If you will make a decision, this is all it is, to separate yourself to pray, the desire which is already there will start working in because it's already there and it'll start coming up. The only difference between those that don't pray and those that pray is the ones that don't pray, don't set, they don't set themselves aside to pray. The ones that do pray, set themselves aside to pray. So now, talk to, talk to people that really set themselves aside to pray. They want to pray all the time. They join prayer groups, and they read books on prayer, and they, they, just, they can talk about prayer for hours. Why? Because they just have made a decision to set themselves aside to pray. Could it be that simple? It is. And we'll go through a lot of scriptures about it. But you could change your whole life by just changing the way you think. Do you know, do you want to have joy in your life? Everybody's why. I just want the joy of the Lord. So I just, let me just listen to another worship music. Let me go to another concert. Let me just, no, no, just, man will have joy by the answer of your mouth. Now, could you get there in a concert? Yeah, but while you're at the concert, declare who you are. So go to the right concert where they're declaring the word. And you start declaring, Father, I thank you that your joy is my strength and I have joy. And pretty soon you're like, whoa, there's joy. The Bible says you'll have joy by the answer of your mouth. The Bible says a lot about if you'll separate yourself then this is where the desire to do these things comes from. It's all there. The Bible will talk about if you feed, you'll get hungry. So it's all up to you. And man, I'm telling you, if you leave here with nothing else tonight, and I think we've kind of laid enough of a foundation now where we could really get into some stuff, realize you are created to be united in fellowship and intimate communion with God 24-7 for all eternity. It's awesome. Every, every revivalist that I've ever read after, Finney, Wigglesworth, Lake, I mean, I could go right down the row. Every one of them said at the end of their, at the end of their ministry, at the end of their life, they wish they would have prayed more. Why? Because the more you give yourself to God, the more you live out of your spirit, you see who you are because you see who he is, and it all flows. And pretty soon, I'm meditating in this word, and I know the voice of God. And I'm just, I'm seeing his written word. And then all of a sudden, when he talks to me about the specific things of my life, I know his voice because I already know it. And I know, and he just leads me and guides me. And pretty soon, I'm living Acts 17, verse 8. It's in him that I live and move and have my being. Amen?